Welcome to The Breakdown with Brad Corp and Becky, a weekly podcast that breaks down politics, policy, and current affairs. I'm Becky Scher. And I'm Michael Broadcorp. Today, we have an abundance of topics to cover. We're going to kick things off by breaking down the 2024 Super Bowl from this past weekend. We will get into the game, the halftime show, our favorite commercials, including what made Becky cry. We're going to head into our interview for this episode and welcome our guest, Bill Walsh, the Director of Marketing and Communications at the Center for the American Experiment. The center is one of the conservative organizations who share an office building in Golden Valley that was recently targeted and set on fire. We will break down the sad and troubling case of what appears to be arson and what comes next in this case and for these organizations. We will then go national and break down the recent Biden documents report and the subsequent disaster of a press conference from President Joe Biden. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you enjoy the show. So it was a big weekend. We had the big game, also known as the Super Bowl, this weekend. So let's break it down. What we did that? First of all, I'm just going to address this again. I've never heard of it called the big game. I understand your concerns about legal compliance, and apparently you're the you did go you did attend law school. And you have some concerns. We're not going to get sued for calling it the Super Bowl, okay? I know we're not going to, but I'm saying it's a thing. Do you ever watch all of the commercials and stuff beforehand? I sent you that article. It's a thing. I know. It's the it's Super Bowl. The, it's the Super, Super Bowl, Bowl breakdown on the breakdown. Great. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. You uh, got when it. When comes, I'll make sure you're alphabetically it goes to you first. Perfect. Your take on the game. So it started out pretty slow. I thought it was pretty, the first half was pretty boring. Second half more than made up for it. It was great. An overtime, a cliffhanger, right nail biter right at the end of the overtime. I loved it. It was a great game. I was, if if I remember correctly, I think I chose the Chiefs were going to win and I think you chose the 49ers. Yes, correct. So I I was right. Okay. You were right. Yes. But it was an overtime game. It was very close. And I just want to be clear. I was rooting for the 49ers. But it w- I was not rooting against the Chiefs. Brock Purdy is, went to Iowa State. My family in-laws are all from Iowa. So I, I was rooting. I was taking the in-house choice and rooting for the 49ers. I certainly was not rooting against, just to be clear, I was not rooting against Taylor Swift or the Chiefs for any objection to them. It was I more appreciate just the clarification. pro Brock Purdy because I do not want anyone to think that I was in any way in that camp. I appreciate that clarification. It was a really great game. Um, it was a great you game. Know, there was some good players on both sides. And so it was fun to watch. I had a good time. What are your thoughts on the halftime show? I want to, before I, I talk about my takes on it, you got nothing? I have, I, I think the best thing that I could do if we want to produce an informed podcast is to let you take it from there because I have absolutely no knowledgeable opinion, nor do I have any business commenting on anything that occurred at the halftime <laughs> show. I saw some of it. It's just, it's, I got nothing. I don't think anyone wants to hear from me about that. They would absolutely love to hear from you about it, though. Like the game, I thought it started off a little slow. I was a little bored on the front end and was a little concerned with his, the amount of breaths he was taking. His stamina seemed, to be fair, when is the last time Usher has performed anything of this caliber, length of time, intensity? I get it. But, But they really came in and redeemed themselves. The roller skating was awesome. The show was awesome. Luda showing up was awesome. Alicia Keys, beautiful, talented, amazing. It was, I loved every bit. Lil Wayne was there. This was my tunes. This was my like high school, college years, music, dancing in the club. This was my jams back in the day. So I was sitting on the couch, jamming out, singing along the entire time. And see, that's why you're the perfect person to comment (laughs) on this. Nobody wants to hear from me. I will just say just. I always watch things through the Super Bowl halftime shows through the lens of Prince's performance in Miami. I still think that was one of Obviously, the best, if, need, if, need, the best. If, if not the best one. But it's great to hear your enthusiasm about the halftime show. I also have some fun facts about the halftime show. Let's hear did it. You, did you know that it was a Minnesota company that produced the rollerblades that Usher and his crew wore? Mm, that sounds made up. Is that true? No, it is. A Redwood based, I think it's Rydell skates. They made the custom skates for Usher and his backup dancers. And yeah, it was a Minnesota angle. Gotta love that. Um, I also saw on TikTok, somebody posted a video. They're like, oh, so that's why we saw Usher at a skating rink in some random town last year. So it's funny to me to think that Usher was just like hitting up skating rinks or skating arenas. I don't know what the indoor skating parks are called, but it was great. I thought it was fun. And apparently he also launched his own line of roller skates now. So you do you, Usher, make your money, take advantage of that opportunity and 
a win for me here. Have you uh, ever been to a roller rink? Oh, yeah. There was one, right? So actually, fun fact, there was one that was in Coon Rapids. I grew up in Anoka, so it was nearby. And it was at one point after when I was in college or something, was in, I think, a Rolling Stone uh, magazine as uh, one of the top places for teenage prostitution in the country. So that's I didn't know any of that going on when I was there back in my day. But uh, we had skating parties there. I was not the I'm not the most graceful individual, but I enjoyed it. That's great. That's fantastic. Yes, I have been. I have been on to a roller skate rink, worn them before. But I played hockey, so I'm more of a instead of a Saratoga two wide, four wide. I'm more of a just a straight rollerblade person. But I it was I, I heard a lot of noise. The roller uh, skating at the halftime show was a nice touch. Yes, and, and once again, fantastic deep dive on you to know those facts. Yes. And before we get into the commercials, which who doesn't love the good commercial conversation, I read an article yesterday that the Super Bowl's ratings, or they set ratings records, had uh, with a staggering 123.4 million viewers, the biggest audience on TV since the moon landing. Yeah. That's impressive. By the way, let's just point out something here. On this show, we landed on the moon. I know there's a whole group of people who think we didn't. We landed on the moon. Okay. So or not, I don't send us DMs or about whether we landed on the moon. Okay. I would, I would be happy to have a conversation about it. Let me know. I'll send all uh, those to you. Perfect. So now commercials. Take let's it away. Start, let's start with funny commercials. So I have two that made me crack up. The first one was Ben Affleck and the Duncans. Yes. Dunkings. I thought it was great. Loved the cameos by everybody. Loved the scenario that I feel like J-Lo probably rolls her eyes at Ben Affleck multiple times a day. And it just somehow that relationship just works. It was cute. It was funny. Big fan. I thought it was number one on my list, too. I thought it was absolutely fantastic. And here's the other thing. how He's in a commercial with his wife. He's with Matt Damon and Tom Brady. That guy's living the dream. Yeah. It was just fantastic. And he was laughing at himself. It was just an it was just the pure essence of what you want to see in a Super Bowl ad. You want to be surprised. You want it to be lighthearted. You want it to be fun. And it was a great commercial. And we agree on that one. And my second favorite is actually a kind of reunion rendition of I believe one of the favorite ones I had last year, a T Mobile with Zach Braff and Donald Faison. I was a Scrubs fan, so I love those two together, listen to their podcast. But this time they had Jason Momoa with them singing outside the house, and Momoa was really into it. It was great. It was funny. It was cute. Love it. I've never watched Scrubs. I've been hearing good things about that show. So good. Yes. My number, the my second favorite was the Christopher Walken, Talking Like Walken, the BMW ad. I just like Christopher Walken's persona. It was great. He'd be a great neighbor to have. He'd be a great person to have in your neighborhood. I've always thought that Christopher Walken and John Malkovich, I would be really good neighbors if I was them. If I was like, they lived in my neighborhood and Christopher Walken was great. So anything that he's in, I'm always a big fan of. Love that. Any other funny ones for you that? That's it. Those are the ones I'm going with. I did also like the Schwarzenegger yes. ones that he had. That was with uh, that Danny was DeVito. Yeah, yeah. State That's Farm. Great. Neighbor. Danny DeVito is just great. Yes. Can't beat it. Now for the teary ones. Man, oh, man. Commercials can get you. I tweeted out last week a Cetaphil a commercial that really highlighted the benefits that we can look to from this Taylor Swift involvement in the NFL cute relationship that through the process of the commercial between a daughter ending up wanting to watch football with her dad, which was not interested in at the beginning. she got, He got her a cute 13 jersey. Adorable. Love a cute daddy-daughter relationship. So that one was great. Another one that I loved was, I believe it was iPhone, but it was a, an app on your phone or an accessibility on your phone for individuals who have sight issues or are blind to be able to take photos. And so it goes through holding your phone up and it says there is one face in the in the screen. There is or two faces in the frame. So you can take, so individuals can still take photos, which was something I never thought about, but a really adorable. It goes through and it's pictures of him meeting a girl and starting to date and going through. And at the end, there are three faces in the frame because they have a little baby. I totally got choked up. I like turn around to my husband as I'm like tears in my eyes. Oh my gosh, it's a freaking commercial. And then the last one, the series that came through, I was really impressed by the stand-up 
to hate, stand up for Israel, stand up for our Jewish allies. There were really good ones. I'm getting goosebumps even talking about it. The one was, I like choked up talking about it, was Bring the Dads Home. It was videos of fathers that are hostages currently with their children and playing with their children. And it's, it, it really, it, obviously got me and still does. But I was really, there was one with, about Martin Luther King. There was a mother in the garage uh, or a mother putting her child into the, the car and there was a swastika on the garage door and the neighbor came over and just painted it while she was gone so she didn't have to come home to it. It really is just so sad that's where we are. But it's so incredible that these organizations came out in force to really drive it home that this isn't okay and we're better than this and our neighbors and we will are stronger together if we stand up together. And there's still a lot of work to be done to bring them home. So I agree with to go up on my teary tangent as I'm like running on a podcast. No, I completely agree with you on all your choices, but particularly the the third one about that campaign about about hate. The all of them were just just tearjerkers and just very emotional. The ones that you highlighted are the ones that just really hit it with me too. Uh, the family leaving and they're coming back, and the neighbor it cleans up the the garage. Plus the videos, uh, it was just heart wrenching, and 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 it was so important. I think we think of the Super Bowl and these commercials to be so joyous of occasion and there are rooms, opportunities for parties and celebrations. But what made that those videos so important of the missing people that are still hostages is just that it's ongoing and some people don't get to celebrate and they're not, and it's not a happy day for them because their family is incomplete and they're not whole. And it's so important that message gets through. And I, I can tell that you're choked up right now talking about it. And it was a very important a message that needed to get through. And I think that they did it in a way in which really touched people. And obviously you were one of those people. And I'm proud of you for, as always, having, wearing your, showing your emotion because it really shows that you care. Thank you. And one last one I want your take on. We saw an ad by Robert Kennedy Jr., who is running as an independent candidate for president. It cost him $7 million for a 30-second ad. Were you surprised? I was surprised yes. to see her. It was a well-done ad. Yes, but I was surprised. Um, my understanding is it was an independent ad by an outside group. Correct. And yes. he, and it was interesting because Robert Kennedy Jr. is obviously running for president. He comes from a very storied, from the Camelot family. Uh, what's interesting is that footage and the concern was that some of the images in that, it was a mock-up of a previous ad that had been done, I think for his uncle, John F. Kennedy, but it had some stock images, which included some of his family members who are not currently supporting his race for president. And so what's been interesting is that what blew up then on, on social media was this ad, and then there was lifetime responses by members of the Kennedy family on Twitter to Robert Kennedy. And so what was interesting is because it was RFK Jr.'s pinned tweet, but then below it were apologies that he was having to send out to his family members. And so there's clear division inside the Kennedy household, which is normal because there's division in any household on political views. There's a lot of his mem members of his family are not supporting his candidacy. And this independent ad, I think, really stepped over the line. And we're always talking a little bit sometimes in this the Super Bowl commercial world about the ones that didn't land. I think this is a good opportunity of an, another example of one that did not land and is and is gonna and have that kind of effect, um, but uh, you did an absolutely fantastic job of, of picking your picks and uh, the ones that you were the ones that were the tearjerkers were spot on choices and uh, good job. And next year we'll be doing it again. Next year we'll be if we do this next year we'll be likely celebrating the Vikings just winning the Super Bowl. Yes, obviously. So For I won't be around in any capacity. I'll be in some. I'll be somewhere just going You'll be crazy. be on the float in the parade. I get it. I'll be on the float in the parade going somewhere, but eventually we'll get to the commercials and hopefully it'll be good. Perfect. So. And then we can't leave this topic without talking about our favorite, a little duo, Travis and Taylor. Taylor, of course, made it back from Japan to watch her boyfriend at the big game. And it was adorable. And she was there with Blake Lively. And yeah, it was cute. She was with Mama Kelsey, brought her down on the field. They went to the after party, which of course the bands played some Taylor Swift songs and Travis Kelsey and her lifted up by, not physically lifted up, but everybody's looking at them as they're singing love story to each other. Come on, it's so cute. I wish we were videotaping this. What is this stream? Because you're just behind the scenes. You're just showing it. Am I using this the right way? This was 
this is your jam. Is that right? This is this is your subject. This is great. This is. It's just cute. I, I mean, just enjoy I think it. How great. can that make you feel? Have, again, he just won his no third Super Bowl. Again, she I just, just won her fourth best album Grammy. Yes, I have no concerns about my concerns were not in any way, shape, or form about her winning or being a part of this. My rooting against the Chiefs was not because of anything related to Taylor Swift. <laughs> you and I had texted offline prior to the Super Bowl about that ad that came out about that dad. It, it was just absolutely perfect in terms of what we've tried to talk about on this show, which is the introduction of Taylor Swift into the NFL has been both a money boost for the NFL and it has been. Um, a great opportunity f- to bring a new audience in to the Super Bowl. And it's just remarkable. And that show really, that episode, that commercial, excuse me, really encapsulated. I will say it was interesting. The number of people who were concerned and understanding aviation for the first time that you can get from Japan to Las Vegas relatively quickly when you have a private jet. Again, to those who don't think we landed on the moon, we did and travel that fast as possible. But it was a great story. And you couldn't have written it any better and you couldn't have written it any better. It was a great game. The Swifties got a big win and there's a whole bunch of people that are upset that the chiefs won because of Taylor Swift. It's just ridiculous. It is good to know that she did win the Super Bowl in her rookie season. She did. And everybody can rest assured the mega conspiracy. She did not endorse Joe Biden at halftime or use any sort of inappropriate platform for the Democrat cause, although she could have if she wanted to. And it's fully within her right. Exactly. This is in Russia. And again, I'll just say once again, my only criticism is she's living my dream. She flew from Japan, where I've always wanted to go on a private jet to Las Vegas, a city that I love because it's the exact opposite of me, flashy and fun. I like Las Vegas. She got to go to a NFL game and see someone that she knows win the Super Bowl. She went from a suite down to the field and got to participate. That's my dream. I just wish I could live it. Kudos to her for winning the Super Bowl in a rookie season. It's about thing. It's about time things started to go Taylor Swift's way. And I hope that the winning of the Super Bowl really starts to get her on a track towards success because she's going to put her on the map. It's really going to put her on the map. I will say I saw someone with a shirt that said. I'm cheering. It was like, I'm cheering for Mr. Mr. Swift or was in essence saying I'm cheering for Taylor Swift's boyfriend, but he didn't name the player because it's just great. It was just a great game. Great Super Bowl, great commercials, tear jerkers. And we got a good political ad that didn't, that missed the mark overall. A wonderful Super Bowl. I'm a, very excited to be speaking with Bill Walsh is today. He's the marketing and communications director for the Center for the American Experiment. Although the reasons we're speaking are not enjoyable, I do want to disclose that I've known Bill for a number of years, and he's one of the most delightful people I've ever met in the world of politics. Bill and I have worked in a number of capacities years, almost decades ago. Bill has an and contagious energy and is the exact type of person you want to be around when you're in the midst of any type of partisan fight because he's a calm presence, but he's also a very enthusiastic presence. And I'm excited that we have an opportunity to talk to him today. But again, the circumstances are not the best. So I hope I'm balancing that well by saying I'm excited to speak with you, Bill, but the reasons we're speaking today are not good. Yeah. You know, we live in interesting times, right? I mean, what a bizarre circumstance, but yeah, it's nice to be with you, Michael. Yeah. You and I have, uh, we've been in some partisan battles. You and we, I have, Bill, we should uh, also say, we've been in partisan some wars. battles. We've been in some, we've been, we've won some things too. You and I were, we, there was a time, not faulting anybody, but there was a time when the Republican Party of Minnesota had money, had staff, had power. We were good at it. And uh, you and I were there at a time when there was just more money and more professionalism, I think. And uh, we had a research department that you ran, we had a media team. We had staff, and we did some important things and won some elections, no doubt about it. Bill, this wasn't planned. I just thought about this. How's your knee? <laughs> do you want me to know? Can we, do we have time? Is there, I think is there we a time limit? Right. I don't think. I, don't okay, think, I, I just right. thought of that because I'm speaking of partisan fights, and I just wanted to yeah. – I was thinking – I think of you every time I get on an airplane and I end up in the middle seat, and I cannot stretch my left knee completely out – and it gets very uncomfortable after a few hours because we were, you and I were working on, our, I think it was redistricting. It was one of the decade redistricting plans. And we were at the Capitol and we said, let's go have lunch. And we used to eat lunch at McDonald's. I don't do that anymore. I probably, you probably don't either. But we're going to, we're driving down the street just from on Aurora there between the Capitol and McDonald's. 
And we look up and there's a guy standing there and he's hitting, he's beating up a woman on the side of the road in this bank parking lot. And I look at you and you look at me and we're like, what the heck is that? We got to stop. This is terrible. So we, you're driving, you pull over and we get out and we start approaching this fight. This very large man is hitting this woman. And I'm thinking we're going to talk to him, right? We're going to say, hey, knock it off. Let's, you should stop doing that. And as we approach, I realize, no, we're not going to talk to him. Michael is a linebacker and he <laughs> leaves his feet midair and takes the guy down. Okay, we're sorry. My headphones are going crazy. We're not going to talk. We're we're so Michael's now on top of him. I best I better get in there. So I jump on. I've got his legs. Michael's got his head and his chest, and we've got him down in a rock guard. And I hit my knee really hard. I think on a rock or something. And I wrecked it. It's been wrecked forever since. But uh, anyway, that was our exciting day. And then of course, wow. as is typical, sadly, the woman did not appreciate our help. And she was yelling at us to get off of him. And he was yelling at us to get off. And uh, we did try to help her, but she did not want our help that day, which was sad. But that and was our exciting. That's just one Michael Brodkob story I could tell. Uh, but yes, I do still think of you every time I get on an airplane because I, I can't stretch my knee out. And we came yeah. back. We, when we left McDonald's and we're coming back, remember, he was on the side of the road with them again. And then we got out again. And the yeah. police came and arrested him. I don't think that story has ever been told before. It wasn't my intention is to tell it. <laughs> But of all the stories that have been told about me, maybe I should have been telling that one more because that was where there was some actually good deeds. We both did some good deeds that day. It was very quick. We didn't, there wasn't much of a negotiation, but we saw that woman being attacked yeah. by that man on the side of the road and we sprang to action very quickly. I should have said, if we were doing lethal weapon, I should have warned you that I was going to just tackle the guy. And in yeah. retrospect, I should have done that. But you were right there with me. You were right along, even though I didn't share the plan. I, with you. And that's the what you want. We're going to talk. We're going to negotiate. We're going to talk. No, we're just going to, we're going to stop this fight right now, which we did. He's a big guy. I am yeah, very impressed, guys. I know we try not to swear on this, but you guys are badasses. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> no. And we the point were. I would say is it wasn't a plan that we were going to do that, but Bill was right there. He was right there, there with me. It was a good time. And I'm sorry about your knee. I hope it, it, it re repairs itself. Okay. What, can we do one other one? My yes. other favorite, my, we were doing a, residency. We were trying to catch oh, Democrats. We did actually yes. catch Democrats yeah. that did not live in their homes and were running for re-election as if they were. And we had subpoenas to deliver for court processes. And we thought it'd be clever to serve the subpoenas to the Democrats in the homes that they weren't supposed to be living in. In other oh, words, in the wrong districts, out of district. So we were sitting at the in Egan um, in front of a woman's name, on she's a public official. She was name was Meg Tilly. I think I'm not Meg Tilly. Something yes, Tilly. it is Meg Tilly. Was yes. It, was, okay, she was a city councilwoman in Egan, and we're sitting in front of her home that she was claiming she didn't live in. It was 7:30 on a Saturday morning, and we're arguing with each other, <laughs> like dumb and dumber. You do it. No, you do it. No, you do it. No, you do it. So we got to go up to the door, knock on the door, and serve the subpoena. And all of a sudden, we look up, and here she comes down the driveway in her. This is important in her nightgown to get the newspaper so michael grabs a subpoena runs up the driveway hits her with the thing on the shoulder and says you've been served and then we leave now it's important what she was wearing because months later in court in front of judge toussaint of the minnesota court of appeals the lawyers for her were grilling michael on what she was wearing in the driveway i'll never forget this under oath, Michael Broadcorp is, look, I have a mom, I have sisters. She was wearing a nightgown because they were saying, no, it was a dress. It was a sundress. They were having a campaign meeting that morning and she was already at work and they were using the house as campaign headquarters. Complete ridiculousness. Of course, they won. They won. They were able to stay on the ballot, although we defeated her because of the embarrassment of that whole situation. So again, that was a win, but never forget that, that Saturday morning in Egan. Bill, that's a great story because I know this all Egan. day. We got to stop. We got to stop. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I got to say this to you. I live in Egan and every time I drive by that place, every time I drive past that intersection, I think of Bill. I think of you and I sitting on the side of the road. Now it's a development there where she no longer lives there. That place is all developed. But every time I drive by that place, which is almost every day, I say to myself, yep, that's where I saw Meg Tilly in a in a what was it? In a nightgown. Nightgown. In a nightgown. In a nightgown. nightgown. And then I had to testify in court as to my knowledge at that point 
in open court in front of everyone about yeah. what a night count is. And I think I was, I think I convinced them that I was at least a subject matter expert based on my experience of what a night count was. And it was compelling testimony. <laughs> we could literally do this all day. This could we be could, it. We got to stop. We got to stop. All right. You're, you're proving the point though. We've been told multiple times that we need to have a war stories episode. And so maybe we need to do that sooner than later and invite some guests on because this is great. Yes. We'll talk about Bill's love of prison movies. And we'll talk Ooh. about that at some point. Perfect. Right. Perfect. Yeah. Right. Move. Bill, again, great to have you on, but terrible circumstances. Tell them what's, tell our listeners what they may already know, but we wanted to speak to you about. Working remote these days because uh, there was an arson fire at our headquarters, our office building for Center of the American Experiment. And so you say, okay, there was a fire. You think popcorn in the microwave. You think an accidental fire, but then you realize, no, two in the morning on a Sunday, April, uh, January 28th. 2 a.m., someone breaks into our building and sets two to two different fires on two different floors. So now you start to think, okay, this is in, this is on purpose. This is a break-in. And, and they'd set two different fires. The first one they set up, we assume it's the first one they set on the third floor at the offices of the Upper Midwest Law Center, a conservative uh, public policy law firm that we're affiliated with and we were in the same building. Um and so that fire, they got into their office suite and actually set the fire in their suite. Their suite is ruined, completely firebombed. And then they skip the second floor, come down to the first floor, and in the hallway between Center of the American Experiments offices and Take Charge offices, Kendall Qualls' organization, they start a second fire there. Now, they didn't get into Kendall's office or into our office, but the hallway is completely burned out and gutted. And so two separate fires, 2 a.m., a break-in. So now you're thinking, obviously arson, obviously criminal arson fire. And obviously, again, we were targeted. There are chiropractors in that office. There are accountants. There are counseling firms. There's a trade association. It's a three-story office building full of businesses. None of those folks, you know, the fires weren't set at their offices or outside of their offices. So there's really only, you can only draw the conclusion that it was, there was, it was arson and it was targeted, politically targeted to these conservative organizations, which is just a new level in the acrimony and the fight that we're all engaged in. So describe to our listeners, the entities that you describe, Take Action, obviously your entity, and then also the Upper Midwest Law Center. What type of work do those three entities do in their separate kind of missions that would, in this scenario, potentially make them a target for a firebombing or an arson? American Experiment, we've been around for 30 years. We're Minnesota's think tank. We're, you know, we're obviously conservative. We don't hide that. Uh, we're economic, free market-based, uh, uh, conservative think tank. We write about education, energy, healthcare, pol uh, public safety. Uh, we have two economists on our staff. We comment on the state budget. So we're in the game, certainly kicking out content. And uh, we do some campaigns, and we uh, certainly rile things up. We're not afraid of that. Uh, Take Charge is Kendall Qualls' organization. Uh, he's really really a problem for liberals, especially a problem for minorities or black liberals, because the narrative that the narrative of systemic racism that has held black people back is completely refuted by his existence, first of all, as a successful man and also his organization. And his, his mission is to kill that narrative. And, he, and, and his hypothesis, really more than hypothesis, is that it's the breakdown of the family and especially the black family the lack of fathers and the lack of the, of the family that has caused the problems in the black community, not systemic racism, and certainly not uh, going to be solved by diversity, equity, inclusion. He's got a very strong message. He's not afraid to deliver it. And then Upper Midwest Law Center, just think public policy uh, law firm that's, that takes on cases on behalf of causes. He's suing Tim Walls. He's suing he sues government agencies. He successfully, they successfully sued the, the city of Minneapolis because they're not keeping up with the charter required amount of police officers. So they take on battles in court, obviously with a, with a, with an ideology behind them. So this is, these are the organizations that were targeted with this arson. This happened on a Sunday night. Yeah. 2 AM Sunday morning, I guess you'd say. So Sunday, so there was January 28th. No staff in the building. So no one, right. uh, that's good. It's good to know. Thankfully, nobody there when it happened. Nobody injured. And so from the other thing I want to point out is just the layout because there was, this is an office complex. 
and Golden Valley, and there's but it's a it's these fires, these targeted fires went on floor number one and floor number three, and very targeted in locations. So logically, because of I think it's fair to say because of the ideology of these organizations, because of what they're focused on, it's pretty clear. Also based on the layout and where these fires happened, that this was very likely politically motivated in some way. I don't think you can deny it. It's, you can't look at that those facts and conclude something else. That's why the FBI is investigating. That's why ATF is investigating. Hennepin County is in there investigating. And by the way, they're taking this very seriously. And we've got nothing but great cooperation from them and a really good feeling about how serious they think this case is, how they're chasing down leads. I believe they're going to catch them. And I just want to say people should know that there's all this, oh, cons conservatives don't trust the FBI these days, and I get why they might not, but there's no reason not to trust the local FBI, ATF, Hennepin County. They're taking this very seriously, and there's a robust investigation going on. I think they're going to catch them. Let's, we know who's taking it seriously, including us, other people in the state on both sides of the aisle are taking it seriously, except for one person individually. A, a state representative went out very quickly in this and did some did send out some inappropriate tweets mocking this. And let me just put this in the context. This is a fire. This is a firebomb that's there. And as someone who worked with Bill Walsh in a number of years, it wouldn't have been unreasonable to think that he would have been working at two o'clock in the morning based on his work ethic. And so for this to happen is a very serious situation. And what happened was, and Abel, I'll let you tee it up. There was a DFL state legislator who thought this was something that people should maybe make fun of. Yeah, our friend Andy Smith, Representative Andy Smith from Rochester, who if we've, in the American Experiment, we've written about several things he said, written, proposed legislation. So we call him our friend. He might be one of the most unserious people ever in the legislature. I, I've, I've written that before. I'll say it again. He's just not a serious person. And, and Rochester should really find someone else to send to St. Paul to represent. And so, yeah, it's not a laughing matter. It just it's really not. isn't. And I know a lot of things on Twitter it is funny. And uh, he offered some kind of a meme that's invoked uh, the office. That was a, I'm not a big office guy. My kids watch the office. I'm not a big office guy, but apparently there was a fire in the office. Was a, so some, something that I'm sure was funny to some people. And he, clearly he thought it was funny. It's just not really, it's like too soon or not something you joke about. And uh, boy, the, the, the blowback must've been really strong because he actually took down his Twitter account or uh, after getting, I suppose, people reacting to his joke. You know, that always happens. It, it, people are unserious and it's just, if it gets to the level of acrimony and the polarization, and we, we're not afraid as a conservative organization to engage. And man, you, let's, let's, let's stick to issues and let's let's stick to substance. And the, this, you know, the, the fire in itself takes it to a new level of, of violence and arson and, and damage. And then the, then the jokes about it don't fit either. We've, we've got to stick to let's have a robust argument on policy and, and have it out. And let voters see the argument and make good decisions based on that. What I what I find so challenging, in particular, because I, Bill, we, you, we and I have worked together in a number of capacities over the years. It's been a long time, but I couldn't imagine. I guarantee you, if we were working in, in at a conservative outlet and this had happened on the other side, your reaction would not have been to tell anyone to go out and make fun of it. You would have taken this very seriously. And to see that done, particularly when, again, I'll just go back to our listeners. It did happen apparently very late in the night, early in the morning, but based on Bill Walsh's work ethic, he very likely could have been there. And you're also dealing with the aftermath of very likely people's personal effects, where they work. It's, a, it's an incredibly traumatizing situation. I have to imagine for staff, for people to see the remnants of where they work, it's a violation. For someone to go out and mock that and lampoon it is just so reprehensible to me. And I'm sorry that happened, and, and I think he should be formally apologizing for what he did. Yeah, you're right about the, the trauma aspect. I, when None of us are comfortable being victims, and especially, uh, I don't know, I don't like that status, but we do have some, we do have a lot of, we have 21 people that work in that office, not just our office too, the whole building is now upended, all the businesses, you know, we're seeing them in the parking lot as they're getting their stuff out of their offices and dealing with this. This is a huge disruption in their businesses. But we have a few young moms that work at our office. They frequently bring their children in. So now there's this new level of fear. Do I have to fear going to work? Obviously, we work in the arena. We know that. We accept that. But now that these folks that work with us now have to a new level of fear, 
And as we're looking at new office space, now we're looking at security and cameras and locks and key cards and everything else. So you're right. It does serious damage. A couple things I want to chime in on here. One, I don't think it was even funny to do that, even if it was a completely accidental electrical fire. I don't think it is ever, it, like you said, it is a loss of things. It's a loss of of tangible things and memories or whatever it is. I don't think it's a funny joke, even if it wasn't a targeted thing. But I completely agree. He, he needs to come out and, and formally um, apologize for that. We've talked about this a lot with other scenarios of elect, as it surrounds politics and elected officials and showing up at people's houses and this kind of fearful, harmful attacks that we are seeing, it should be condemned across the board. That is not something that is should be Democrat on Republican or vice versa. It it has simply gone too far. We all need to collectively do better, be supportive, and and tone down that rhetoric that is it is is getting us there. I do want to real quick do two quick disclosures. One, the firm that I work for has done work for Take Charge before. And since we were talking about that a little bit, great organization, a lot of really good stuff that they're doing, but want to make sure that we're keeping things uh, correct on the record. And I also have gone back, worked with Bill Walsh way back in 2010 on Emmer's race at the state capitol uh, and along the years. Those are the two things. But I do, before we move on of the uh, evolution of what you guys have found out, You've worked in politics for decades. Have you ever experienced any targeting like this? Obviously, this is a, a, a magnitude that hopefully has we haven't seen much around here. But are there? It, it certainly has evolved over the last, I would say, probably five, ten years in particular. What's your thought on that evolution of the ramped up um, anger towards people that are opposed to us? And, and do you have any other experiences with that? I'm sitting here thinking, I don't remember anything like this. It's a good in- thing. I never feared, I never thought about my, when my kids were young and we were doing this in this business. I just, I can't think of anything. It was always rhetorical. It was always the argument. It was always your side, our side. And then we were, we we're trying to win votes most of my career, just trying to either make con- legislators look good and then eventually win votes or help challengers defeat legislators and win votes. And man, I don't remember anything personally, or even people I worked with, there's always death threats. They, they come in for elected officials, mm-hmm. but nothing. No. Well, that's and, a good and, thing. And I mean, Bill, we worked on particularly the O2 race. There was, it was a lot of emotion in that race. Obviously what happened when Senator some before and after th- that circumstance, but nothing mm-hmm. even remotely like this. And when I first heard the reports, I'm like, I hope it wasn't, but it's very clear as more information's come out, particularly the placement of the office is what happened, that this was very likely deliberate and targeted. And there's also this kind of model that this phrase that people will throw out is, which is they're obviously getting under their skin. No, this is not a kind of get under their skin response. This is incredibly dangerous and traumatizing and impactful to people. And there's not anyone in politics whether they work for a think tank, think tank, they work for a political party, an elected official or a staffer should have their office firebombed and targeted like this. It's a shame. And Democrats and Republicans should be standing up and saying, this can't happen. And anything that can be done to be a voice for ensuring that doesn't happen, they should be doing. And I'm disappointed that you guys haven't received that kind of uniform, bipartisan response to say enough is enough. There's been some. I Good. wouldn't discount it. Governor Walls sent out a tweet condemning the action. Good. That was well received by our staff. Star Tribune editorial board wrote a very nice piece just condemning this kind of behavior. It gave us a nice little microphone. So if, if, you remind me of the 2002 campaign and it's like in a different era, a different world. Go back one more war story. But the, the Wellstone plane crashed and one of the people that died in that plane crash was a young guy named Will McLaughlin yes. who was Wellstone's body man and kind of his young driver – and Michael, you and I were hi- hiring trackers, you know, in the early tracking days. So we had young college kids going to every Wellstone event, trying to get video, trying to listen to what he said, take notes, follow us back to the office, tell us what's going on. And those young trackers actually had a relationship with young Will McLaughlin. And they were absolutely quite devastated when they found out that he died, because even though they were adversaries at every event, it was the, it was the, oh God, here's our Republican trackers. All right, we get it. You got to set up your camera. You got to get the Senator on the video, but everybody knew their role. And there wasn't that level of animosity that you see today. And I'll never forget that when those young guys found out that, that Will was one of the, the people that died in that crash, 
they were actually like, oh man, that, we worked against that guy, but we worked with that guy. There was respect. It, everybody understood it was a, you know, a bit of a game in politics, although we needed to know what the senator was saying daily on the trail so we could counteract that in a message uh, perspective. But that just, I don't know if that happens today. That was 2002. That's not that long ago. Yeah, I remember that moment when I know the trackers' names. I won't say them on air, but it was—I'll say their first names. When Jim and Tim found out what was going on, it was a—they were incredibly upset. And, mm -hmm. and not again to take anything away from those that knew Senator Wilson and those staff closer, but that's the type of relationships that used to exist in partisanship, where there we recognized that we wore different colors on the field, reds versus blues or whatever, but there was a mutual respect and Greens, admiration. Red and green. And there is mutual admiration, and that's been lost. And Bill, I hope your organization and all the organizations that were targeted and a part of this continue to thrive and survive, and your staff is able to deal with this. And if there's anything that we can do on this podcast to be helpful to either promoting your message or helping in any type of, with any type of uh, raising awareness about the incident, driving people towards law enforcement sources. Is there some place that people should contact if they have any information? I think there was a reference to, I think the, the Golden Valley Fire Department is handling it. Where should tips or leads go? FBI is, the local FBI office has a tip line up. I can't remember it off the top of my head. It's in a press release we put out, but just we'll uh, the local FBI office is taking tips for sure. I think it's fbi.tips.gov. Great. Uh, it's the best place to do that. And then americanexperiment.org. People want to help. They can send us piles and piles of money. We always need money. Insurance is going to cover furniture and things like that. There will be some incidental costs to relocating. I just tell you, we're not missing a beat. We're going to we're keep kicking out the content. Everyone's got their laptop. Everyone's got an internet connection. And we will continue the work that we're doing. We'll keep on fighting. Where can people follow you on social media? You are at Bill T. Walsh. T. Walsh. At Great. Twitter. Cool. Well, thank you so much for joining us, but especially under the circumstances, I hope your knee does get better. Take maybe that chiropractor down the hall that has a functioning office can maybe provide some assistance and yeah. just send me the bills. All right, sir. Sounds good. Thanks a lot, thank guys. You, yeah, bye -bye. Bye. Yep. He is, he's just a joy. I've yeah. always enjoyed me too. Um, working with Bill in the past. He's just got that very enthusiastic energy and enthusiasm. And I will just say again, uh, two things. Number one, it would not have surprised me one bit if Bill Walsh would have been in the yeah. office working that late or someone would have been there because people who work in this kind of, even though they don't do direct partisanship, they're a think uh -huh. tank. People burn the midnight oil. Yeah. And to think that that was done is just horrific. And I just have I to say, I understand it may have just been one, one DFLer who said something, but the fact that enters into someone's frame of mind is just so frustrating. And it's something that we've talked about is that I like to believe in, and I shouldn't say I like to believe, I know that if this had happened on the other side, we would be doing everything we can to help steer attention towards that way. And it was always nice to hear to, to speak with Bill, but under the circumstances, it's just tough to hear what's going on with them. Yeah, it, it, Bill is great. And I've always enjoyed working with him too. He's a good voice for the mission, for the issues and policies and moving the needle forward. Um, and, and it is, it's just, it is scary. Like I said, as we've talked about over the last couple of years, things have definitely amped up. I remember working on campaigns in 2018 and, and 2020 and not wanting to, if I had to stop and get gas and go into the gas station, not wanting to go in wearing my Republican garb all the time because you just don't know what somebody is going to say or do, which is just a really unfortunate place. And and I can't imagine having, like you talked about, feeling that violated of a very targeted attack on your organization for your views, for your work. It can't, you, you can't fault these folks for feeling some sort of trauma from that and really disappointing that anybody, let alone a state representative, would think that sort of reaction was okay. I hope they find the pre person or people who did this and we'll stay tuned. Yes. I hope to speak to Bill again under better circumstances. And I do hope Absolutely. his knee gets better. I do hope his knee gets better. Those were some great stories. We really need to get this war war stories on the books and bring some of our campaign friends along for the ride. He was right there. It wasn't I it wasn't the type of situation where you're gonna you were gonna talk someone down. And so I did, but he was once I was out of the car and he was right there by my side. And that's the type of person you wanna have. Oh, absolutely. 
Yeah, I don't think I don't think my family knows that story. So I better to update them about what is going to be on the be better. podcast. Last week, the special counsel report on the Biden documents came down. They determined it was insufficient evidence to charge Biden with a crime. Uh, surrounding that, holding, storing in his garage, classified documents of whatever level. The more notable thing that came out of that, I think, is less notable that he didn't get charged and more notable, the context about his memory and capacity, mental capacity. A quote from the report said, and her believed that there were numerous reasons why a potential jury would find reasonable doubt at trial, notably that Biden would come across not only as sympathetic, but forgetful and not capable of the willfulness required to convict. There were comments about an elderly man with memory issues. The report stated that Mr. Biden's memory was significantly limited both during his recorded interviews with the ghostwriter in 2017 and his interview with our office in 2023. Apparently, he could not remember the years he was vice president when his son Bo died. It is a little shocking, not shocking and shocking. I think from my perspective, the shocking part is that these mental capacity memory issues were so significant that it warranted that inclusion in the report. We've seen Biden struggle at the podium, struggle in interviews, struggle while he's out at events. So there was has been that concern. We haven't we've talked about that before. But to see it to this level just seems wild that it was so significant. What's your take on it? It was a devastating report. And I think as you teed up and framed up, it really sets up, it, it is a independent, an in, a strong independent verification of what has been an ongoing discussion in the race for president. And it's concerning. It's very concerning. And I think that Biden's response to it was not helpful. I can understand from his perspective and from the perspective of Democrats, I've heard that they feel that this report got into too much and it wasn't, it was unnecessary, it was gratuitous, but it does confirm a pre-existing narrative that people have. It does concern, confirm a pre-existing narrative that, that people have. And I think it's going to be a challenge and I don't think it's going to go away. I think that as I still believe it's going to be Trump and Biden as the nominees, but I think that this discussion about Biden's age and what's in this report is going to mainstream and provide a new injection of information into this debate that could recalibrate it in some way. I still think it's going to be Biden and Trump, but it's certainly, there are some hurdles that have been put in his place. There have certainly been some hurdles. Absolutely. I'm about 50-50 at this point. I'm, I am I could see a, a quick tumble to, 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 get Biden to say he's not running again and somebody else to go up in his place. Partially, not only because of what was in the report, but I think the subsequent actions of that as well. So we had Biden's team response. So I want to get, as somebody, you and I both have worked in communications, we've worked for candidates, electeds, all of the sorts. And uh, so I want to first start with the the team's response. Obviously, they're disagreeing. They don't believe that the report's treatment of Ms. President Biden's memory is accurate or appropriate. There is ample evidence from the interview that he did well answering the questions of years old events over the course of five hours. That's pretty standard. The one that bothered me is the attorneys noted, Biden's attorneys noted that the interviews took place in the midst of the October 7th attacks on Israel when Biden was busy, quote, conducting calls with heads of state, cabinet members of Congress, and meeting repeatedly with his national security team. Now, that may be well and true. And it is understandable that anybody doing anything uh, when you're the president of the United States um, after a, an attack like what happened on October 7th in Israel would be a little distracted. However, your job of president of the United States is you got to do it all. You have to have the capacity to do it all. You have to be, whether it's dealing with Israel, whether it's dealing with something in the United States or other allies or conflicts around the world, you got to be able to do it all and do it well. And so it is concerning that they tried to pass that buck and try to be, I feel like, tried to gloss over, brush it under the rug because of this and thought that people, that would be a valid excuse. Yes, I think there's an expectation, as you articulated, that the president, whoever it is, always multitasking. With the vice president is multitasking when they're doing their job. 
there's an expectation, I think, and it's, it really gets to a very discussion point, a very interesting point that I would like to bring up. You and I have both, in some capacities, have been in the presence of presidents, and that's an opportunity that I think was a real honor, and I, and I hope to have that opportunity again. If there's one question that I could ask a president, it would be not anything about policy or anything, is how they handle the mental challenges and strain of being president. Because one of the things that we know is that there's all these fundraising objectives and campaign strategies, but we really do not get into how on the kind of the personal level, we have not mainstream discussions as to how executives, people who are running for president, how they in their daily lives deal with stress and how they balance their communication flow and how they deal with this. Obviously, there is the office of the presidency has a, a structure in place. They have in-house doctors and they have a medical team and there's all this existing kind of permanent bureaucracy. But I've always believed that one of the most, if I could ask a president one question, and at some point I hope to ask either he or she a question about what would, how they handle it. And the question I would say is, how would you deal with that? Mr. President, Madam President, if you're in the midst of a crisis, if you're just, or in the normal day, of being president of the United States. How do you handle that stress? How are you dealing with that mental strain, both just waking up every day in the residency, getting a presidential daily briefing of all of the problems that are going on in the world? There's threat, threat assessments that are contained in that document. So you're, it's not as if you're starting off your day by reading the Sunday comics. You're getting basically a mem your first kind of, one of your first objectives that day is to participate in a, a series of briefings talking about the current threat assessment against the United States domestically and threats against assets for in, across the world. How do you balance that? How do you deal with the stress and the rigors of the day? How do you handle that flow of information? Because here's the thing, everyone's brain is the same in most ways. It's generally the same kind of composition and the stressors that they're dealing with, they're not as if they're robots. So how do they handle that stress? And I think what we're seeing in a very normal way is as as Biden has gotten older, his cognitive abilities and his ability to respond as quickly as he can has diminished. And that's just apparent. If you literally just watch on, on C-SPAN, old videos versus now, he has slowed down. I understand that is completely and utterly normal. But what I will just simply say to you is that, that it is re all of these questions are reasonable to ask. And I would love to ask a, that type of question of a president. Maybe someday I'll get to ask he or she about it and say, how do you handle that stress? Because I know what I do to balance dealing with information and how I kind of firewall things and not do two things at the same time. But I think it's challenging. And it's certainly, and excuse me, I just take up no disrespect. I'll have to edit that out. No disrespect to President Biden or his accomplishments, but he is 80 years old. And that is a real challenge. And I think it's reasonable to say He's not a superhuman. He's not RoboCop. He's not a cyborg. And how is he handling with those stressors? And this is going to continue to become an issue. Absolutely. And I think we saw a lot of that. Like you said, it, it is, um, it, it is, he's 81. It, it is a common thing to have a decline when you get a certain age. And, and that's not surprising, but it is something that I think we need to, to look into. So I didn't love that um, kind of excuse that they gave there. <clears throat> Another question I have for you is what Biden did after that. He did a press conference. Now, again, we worked in a lot of situations with people who want to do a press conference, want to get in front of the cameras, tell their side of the story. There are times where it is good and necessary to do so. And there are times when you should wait a beat, wait until the next day, maybe. And and this is one of those, I think. I, I with Biden's age, with being upset and fired up about this report, and obviously he took offense to a lot of this and what some Democrats were saying afterwards, it is understandable that President Biden was angry about this. And that very much came across at that press conference. He went up there, asked questions, was fiery, was a little inappropriate with the reporters. And if it was you, would you have let your candidate or elected go up and do a press conference that night? Or would you have said, why don't we hold off until tomorrow? You're a little bit more fresh, a little bit more ready, a little bit more relaxed. I, I think it's a, I think they're damned if they do and damned if they don't. I think if they would have waited until the morning, it would have, and that's the circumstance. Sometimes mm -hmm. they don't have that option. If there's an office that's open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, 366 with the leap year, 
It's the office of the presidency. And so I don't know. This was spiraled very quickly. This was, it was interesting. This was a day where I was in meetings and didn't see it play out on social media. And so I was catching up. I understand why they had to respond. I think they, I think that they made the best of the bad options that they had. I think that was the best. I'm thinking of the movie Argo where it's basically, this is the best, the best bad option that they have. I think that was the best bad option that they had because if they waited until the next day, I think it would have created more of a firestorm. But the problem is, which I think we'll talk about, is that Biden's reaction and what he did that night, I don't think calmed anyone's fears. And it 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 did nothing to soothe any of one's concerns. It, in fact, I think validated some of the concerns. I completely agree. I think not only how much on the attack he was, I think that he was speaking through grit teeth and you could just tell he was seething from all of this. But one of this, one of the things that he also said here really irked me. He was asked if he takes responsibility for the documents side of things. This was not about the memory or his age. He said, I take responsibility for not watching what my staff was doing. Now, you're the president. I get it. You got staff. You don't know 99% of what is actually going on. I think for a lot of elected officials, what staff is doing, there's just no way that they can be in the know of everything. That's why you hire good staff and have good people around you to run your office and to do that for you. However, the buck stops with you. And at the end of the day, did you not go into your garage and ask ever curious what these piles of boxes and documents were? So I, I didn't love the passing of the buck and not taking any responsibility. I think it could have been a simple, I was not aware that this happened at the time. We should have done better going forward. I'll make sure I don't let it happen again and moved on. So didn't love that. But I would agree with you on that. And I think one thing that I will say, and I think is important, to, just my perspective, I would, I would like to get your take on this. I think the American people want from their elected officials responsibility. I think that they can be very forgiving in the right circumstances. And accepting accountability and being responsible allows, it, it, that's, that's something that the American people want to see. And I think sometimes, and I think Biden has not done a good job of this. He, we are his bosses. He answers to us, not the other way around. And I think that could have been a situation where he could have been, look, I accept complete and total responsibility for the documents and how they were stored, that the buck stops with me, I'm the president, and I take accountability for that. I think he could have waded into some of the personal issues and how he felt the report was prepared, the stresses and strains that he was under at the time, and I think he could have dealt with that in a way. But I think there was an opportunity for him to strike a balance and accept responsibility by also showing a level of defiance. I think he spread the, if those were the ingredients of what they wanted that press conference to be, I don't think they, they was mixed in the right proportions. I will also say to you that it, again, this is the problem, is that it reinforced every existing narrative. And I think that they had a number of bad options and that I think they picked the best bad option that they had. But I'd be curious, I think in the aftermath, I think there may have been uh, a better option that they could have done something better they could have done. Yeah. It, it, yeah, I, I agree. It was, I think there was probably also a rawness for President Biden with the inclusion of uh, the comment about not remembering when his son died. That is something that I think probably hurt more and hit more home because, of course, you remember when your child has passed. I, I can't imagine and that not really hitting him deep and cutting him deep. And and then that came through too. So it, it you're right. I think it was maybe the best of, of bad options and moving forward without another 12 hours without doing that would just let the fire and the Democrats who were coming out against this be a little bit more vocal and could have caused more troubles. One question I did have for you is the Trump versus Biden scenario when it comes to this. One of the big differences I saw in the report and the re and and what came out afterwards is that her said the 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 general counsel her said that the biggest difference or, or a difference was that Trump refused to return his documents and obstructed justice throughout the process where President Biden was forthcoming, sat down, let them take everything. Do you think these were handled differently or do you think they were handled differently because of the circumstances surrounding the gathering of information and documents? 
I think that they were handled differently and appropriately different because of the circumstances of each situation. Agreed. I think that the problem, one of the problems we have, and I want to just correct myself, I think I said Biden was 80. I believe he, it was 80. I believe he's actually 81 and Trump is currently 77. How this is going to be framed out is, here's the thing, most people, aside from aside from political nerds like you and a little bit of a junkie like me, are, are going to get into kind of the minutia of di- understanding the differences between these two cases, and we can fisk and analyze if one was treated different than other. But it's going to be how most Americans are going to hear this story framed out is going to be through the voice of President Biden and the voice of Donald Trump. And in terms of the ability in terms of the ability to construct a political argument in response to what's being done, Donald Trump, this is where Donald Trump's wheelhouse is. He is much stronger at throwing the mud in an articulate, concise way, even though he's completely full of it when he discusses it. It's at least a narrative that is understandable for his base and for his people. Now, I completely disagree. He has no fidelity to the facts and nearly everything that comes out of his mouth would not, should not, and does not pass a, a, a fact check. But Biden in response is slow and is not as strong with his words and his passion. And I'm not talking about Biden's you know, speech issues. I'm talking about just where he's at currently. He is not a, vo- he is not a good vehicle and a good vessel to promote strength and that there is a steady hand at the tail. I would argue that Donald Trump is not, but in terms of the contrast of the two, because elections have, do not happen in a vacuum. It's Biden versus Trump. And so Biden will be judged in response to how Trump acts and vice versa. And so in, if there is an argument that is played out this election cycle, just rhetorically on these documents, even though I do believe that there's, as we most people know, there's some legal action that Trump could be facing this year about these documents that will not likely ensnare Biden in the same way. But in terms of the rhetorical messengers and how that message is delivered, I think Trump is more equipped and is stronger at delivering his defense just verbally. And we know how people consume information and how Trump delivers it is a much more concise and powerful way than I think Biden is able to do it. And that's where I think this is, I think that's why the race is going to be so close. I hope I'm discussing Biden. I hope to be 80 someday. I know 80 year olds, I'm not trying to be disrespectful in any way, but I'm trying to just responsibly talk about it. And that's what I think. I think you summed it up well. It will be interesting to see how this plays out. I do believe, I do agree with you that Trump is more well suited for this kind of scenario and the attack and his verbiage that he uses in situations like this. But at this time, it is Biden versus Trump, and we'll see if it stays that way. So another big thing happened this week. It was the start of the 2024 legislative session. We will get into everything in an upcoming episode. But one comment we did want to chat about is there is a new Senate uh, majority leader. Yeah, Senator Aaron Murphy is taking over for Senator Dietzik. I just want to just share a very brief story. After, as everyone knows, I was hit by a car uh, last April. I received just a wonderful note from Senator Dietzik in response to uh, me getting hit by a car. Just a very kind statement, and I just want to acknowledge uh, that I'm. I, I wish her all. I wish her a, a very speedy recovery and a and a quick return to the legislature in any capacity. She's one of the good ones, and and I do hope that she gets back to a stronger place very soon. Absolutely agree. Sending her all of the well wishes, and we will chat more about legislative session and what to expect in the coming episode. So thank you for another great week, Michael. It's great to be here, and we'll be kicking things off again next week. Sounds great. Bye. Bye. We want to thank you for listening to The Breakdown with Broadcore Rebecca. Before we go, show some love for your favorite podcast by leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or on the platform where you listen. You can leave a review or give us a shout out on our website or across all social media platforms at BB Breakpod. The Breakdown with Broadcore and Becky will return next week. Thank you again for listening.